Ronald, the rules lawyer here. It was only when I started preparing for today's video that I realized that the Pathfinder designers might have nerfed necromancers too much. Historically in D&D and 1st edition Pathfinder, necromancers could have small armies of the undead that could sometimes hog up playtime and give DMs a lot to handle and were, was sometimes overpowered. And understandably, there's been reining in of the ability of necromancers to do that, somewhat in D&D 5th edition, but especially so in Pathfinder 2nd edition. And so we see uh, big limitations on how many allies a player can have or a character can have in combat. Now, I'm all for that overall change. Uh, I think that it uh, leads to more balance in the game and prevents uh, and, allow, and encourages people to look to each other and uh, ha collaborate in combat. Uh, but I think some of the options in Book of the Dead show a uh, concern about balance that I think is a little overzealous. So I'll go over those things when I discuss them. Okay, so in today's video, I'm going to go over the options for harnessing the undead. So this will include the two archetypes and also undead companions, familiars, and undead eidolons. One important thing about harnessing undead in Pathfinder is that in the lore of Galarian, it's uh, usually an evil act because when you animate a corpse, you desecrate the body and also can hold their soul uh, to prevent the soul from reaching the afterlife. And so this note is given in the book and you'll need to talk to your GM and find out the nature of your campaign before you take up one of these options. Uh, there are ways the GM can accommodate uh, you without you necessarily being an evil character, and I'll go over those when they come. Also, there's a skill feat uh, that is important to talk about now, uh, which is the Stitch Flesh skill feat. Undead creatures cannot be healed under the normal means uh, in Pathfinder, which usually are healing spells that often have the positive trait. They don't benefit from positive energy. Being beings of negative energy, they are uh, counterposed to positive energy. And also the usual medicine skills. Treat wounds does not work on undead creatures. In comes the Stitch Flesh skill feat, which lets you treat wounds on undead creatures, basically patching them up, also using the medicine skill. And so there's that. And uh, battle medicine does not benefit from this feat. So if you have a party or even uh, one party member who depends on undead allies, that it's that's an important feat to take. Chapter two opens with three feats that a number of player characters can take. Wizards with the Necromancy School, clerics who have a divine font of negative energy, oracles with the Bones Mystery, and characters that can control or create the undead. So that's an important category because any character can learn the Create Undead ritual. The first feat is a level four feat that gives a boost to undead creatures that are under your control. They get a plus two status bonus, to saving throws against positive damage, and to will saving throws against effects that would control them. This is in a 30-foot radius. Well, the problem with this feat is that there are not many enemies in Pathfinder that use positive energy to attack your party. Uh, the only exception would be if your party has a lot of undead creatures in it. So that's pretty campaign specific. So. I was a little unhappy seeing that one. Next is Necromancer's Visage. This is like the first level cleric spell, Sanctuary, that forces creatures that try to attack the caster to have to make a will save in order to try to do that. And this is not a spell. It's just simply your overall uh, aura, uh, your visage that you project. Uh, and it applies only to undead creatures. And uh, whenever you use a hostile action against an undead, undead creature, then this ends and you have to spend 10 minutes outside of combat to get it back. Uh, but this looks like a fun situational ability that you can use, say, um, walking among... Oh, it it's only affects those undead creatures that are at most your level minus two. 
Uh, so if you see undead creatures, uh, you can walk among them and with impunity and then unleash a big devastating spell against them with this. Um, or walk amongst the, the undead uh, overall in a, in a roleplay situation. Next is the Sepulchral Sublimation. This is a 14th level feat. And this lets you destroy uh, a minion that you permanently control to, uh, so that when you cast a spell that is at most half um, the level of that creature, so let's say 10th level minion, so therefore 5th level spell or less, when you cast that spell, you don't expend the energy to cast it. And this is a feat I will criticize. It seems too weak, and think about it, what is... Oh, it has to be one you permanently control. So this means an undead companion, which when you sacrifice them, you need a day of downtime to replace, uh, or a um, undead that you've created through the Create Undead ritual. And when we look at... Okay, you can get this at the earliest at level 14, at the expected... Um, wealth of a level 14 character, 9300 gold, we see that the highest, uh, and well, one of the highest monsters that you can create with a Create Undead Ritual is level 10, which costs 3000 gold to do. And for you to spend one third of your entire uh, adventuring career's earnings so that you could cast a one of your uh, weaker spells uh, that you already can cast and not have to pay the price for it just seems too severe a cost. And I honestly do not know uh, whether this was intended. <laughs> Maybe permanently um, uh, made it through an editing pass because I can see this work as uh, just something you summon um, from an animate dead spell and sacrificing it. and. The, what we can compare it to is Final Sacrifice, which lets you cast uh, a spell um, and then destroy the mon uh, to, to summon something, then destroy it, and you create, with the second level version, a 6d6 damage area. And that is actually a little strong for a second level spell, and this gives you the equivalent of a spell of a spell level two levels lower. So that just does not seem strong enough to me for a level 14 feet. So now we go to the archetypes and here's my usual format of saying overall thematically what it is, choose this for this reason, and then go into the mechanics. So the first is the reanimator. And this is something that you obviously want to choose if you want to animate the dead. And notably, you do not need to be evil um, to uh, choose this archetype. The only requirement is that you are able to cast Animate Dead with a spell slot. What the dedication feat does is give you greater access to Animate Dead, so that if you're a spontaneous caster, it automatically becomes one of your signature spells that you can uh, level, um, heighten at will, and it does not count against your other signature spells. If you're a prepared spellcaster, you get to spend 10 minutes outside of combat to replace one of your prepared spells with animate dead of the same spell level. In addition, if you uh, have a corpse, an appropriate corpse in the area, you can animate that as part of your casting, and it is more powerful than other animate deads. Uh, it has a plus one status bonus to attacks, skill checks, armor class, and saving throws. So uh, that's good. Next are the optional additional feats. Uh, Deathly Secrets gives you uh, one of two focus spells, and you could take it twice for both. First is Eyes of the Dead, which lets you s perceive through the senses of an undead uh, that you control. Or Subjugate Undead. This is um, lets you try to seize control of an undead that you encounter, and it makes a will save uh, against your casting. And this seems, uh, this is another uh, spell that I'm going to criticize. It is limited to an undead creature that is, at most, your level minus four. In the encounter building system for Pathfinder 2e, you are limited to using uh, creatures, the GM is limited to using creatures that are four levels lower than 
the party's level up to four levels above the party's level. And so this is the bottom, the very, very bottom tier of monsters that you can possibly affect uh, out of nine levels of potential creatures. Now, granted, you're, they're more likely to encounter creatures that are lower level than our higher level, but still, this is very low and it kind of calls for arguably metagame knowledge that the player know uh, that it is of that exact level and maybe have to do a knowledge check for that information if the GM does that. And it costs three actions to do, so you might have to set it up in a previous turn, and it might fail. And also, if it is controlled directly by another enemy on the scene, that enemy gets to make a saving throw also, and the undead creature gets to use the better of the two saving throws, and the master saving throw is probably better uh, at in its will save than the creature you're targeting, which again is only level minus four, and another way in, in which it might fail. And I contrast this with the animate dead spell, which it, when you can cast it, it takes the same amount of actions and it's guaranteed to work. And it's a level, um, it's a creature that's about four levels lower than, your, than you, and it's guaranteed to work. Um, I thought maybe this would have a longer duration to justify um, it, but no, it, if the target fails, it is under your control for one minute. Now, granted, it does not need to be sustained, but again, you have to jump through all these hoops to get to it. And if it critically fails, it lasts for 10 minutes. And most of the time, the party is not gonna encounter another combat during that time. So, uh, next to what Animate Dead can do, this does not seem as strong as it should be. And arguably, it's only a focus spell, and so you can just cast it, and if it fails, just try it again later. But, you know, how often are you going to find things that are exactly level minus four? Uh, and you have greater access to Animate Dead anyway with your spell slot, so why not use that? So I'm not sure um, this... Uh, was balanced right. Now, I don't claim to know what the answer is, and I understand the de designers um, really have a challenge in um, preventing the what I said at the beginning of the video of someone amassing an army of creatures. And the choice that they've made was to make it so that the upper limit of the power of what they can get as a possible longer term minion is about your level minus four. Um, they've chosen to do the same limit uh, of power that is a court that they've decided is appropriate for things that are quite temporary. And I don't know if the same mathematical decision is appropriate. But again, I I'd like to know uh, if uh, I'd like to be proven wrong that they might and that they've <laughs> made the right decision. Again, I don't know exactly how to solve it. I just question using that same uh, mathematical uh, limit. The next uh, feat is Macabre Virtuoso, which gives you the Create Undead Ritual. And unlike other people who get that ritual, you get to do it in four hours only instead of one day. You also get a plus two circumstance bonus when you make the primary check. And you don't need secondary casters, you can do it all yourself. And so you arguably can do it at the beginning of an adventuring day. Uh, you also get the ability to create two types of common undead. And this just goes back to my uh, what I raised earlier about the, uh, the costs of, the, of creating undead um, with the ritual. It, it seems kind of steep to me uh, for what you get. And remember that the, if you have any experience playing Pathfinder and using summoning spells, some summoning um, using animate dead, for example, um, you find that a creature that is about four levels below you lasts one or two rounds at the most if they come under attack. Uh, I basically have seen them used as flanking partners for your allies or cannon fodder to honestly just give the enemy something to distract them with. And to invest a third of your wealth into something that strong um, for that much utility does not seem uh, like the right cost to me. And in addition, when 
these creatures, an undead creature or a construct that you create from from uh, these rituals, which have the same price, goes down to zero hit points, it is destroyed. It cannot be brought back at all. So, feels bad. Uh, next is the uh, Bonds of Death feat. This looks essential. This lets you have um, get closer to that army of dead fantasy of getting a, this time, well, a Pathfinder 2E sized army of a second uh, undead creature in the battlefield. Once per day, you can cast Animate Dead a, um, again, a second time in a battle. And effectively, uh, you are using a signal action now to command both of them, giving them each two actions. Uh, then um, Greater Deathly Secrets at level 10 gives you access to higher, more advanced focus spells. First is Malignant Sustenance, which lets you give fast healing to a willing undead creature. And second is Grasping Grave, which lets you target an area, get arms reaching out from the ground to try to grab at people and also attack people, and you can move it around. So that sounds fun. Uh, 12th level is a focus spell that called Shambling Horror. Uh, if there is a corpse that has uh, was killed with since the previous sunrise, you get to animate it as a skeleton or zombie of the same level. Now, this is, again, restricted to creatures that are your, no greater than your level, minus four. And also, the skeleton or zombie needs to be the same size as what you raise. Um, again, I, I, I don't see this limitation being justified. Um, it, it's three actions, and it only lasts 10 minutes, and you have to go through the shenanigans of finding the right leveled creature, um, which uh, d does not, um, uh, which gives you the effect of animate dead, basically, of giving you a uh, creature of that level. And however, it does last 10 minutes, you don't need to sustain it, but again, it just seems difficult to find that uh, creature of the perfect level. I would argue for a house rule, which is that it doesn't matter what level the corpse you raise, it just becomes a corpse of that level minus four. So there's another house rule from the rules lawyer. Next we'll talk about the Undead Master, which is basically the uh, like the Beast Master from the Advanced Player's Guide, except instead of an additional living companion, it's undead. And you'll want to choose this if you want to have an undead companion, and I'll talk a little later about what makes undead companions different. This archetype requires that you be evil because of the, um, the moral issue uh, that's in the lore of binding undead spirits to you. The dedication feat obviously gives you an undead companion, and it unlocks uh, the feats from the Beastmaster archetype that advance the power of your companion, and also one that lets you use more actions to give your companion more actions, and another to get a second companion into battle. Normally you can only have one. Oh, and it's possible to have more than one companion uh, with the dedication feat, and also with the Beastmaster feat, additional companion. Importantly, you don't get access to the full suite of Beastmaster feats that I didn't list. And you get in exchange these two feats that are unique to the Undead Master. First is called Guardian Ghosts, that if your Undead Companion is adjacent to you and you are damaged, you get to use a reaction to dir uh, uh, direct some of that damage to the Companion. The level 12 feat is pretty good, and I think is part of the reason, maybe the reason why it, this archetype doesn't give you the same uh, feats that Beastmaster gets. It's called Their Master's Call. So if you have a a uh, second companion, uh, or an inactive companion that's undead, that's not in the battlefield, you get to uh, spend an action to get its support benefit applied within 30 feet of you. So the spirit of your undead companion does what it does uh, in combat, while your present companion does what it does, which you can command as another action. So you essentially have the effect of two companions uh, and with the high level feat lead the pack, pot potentially a third companion uh, in battle, um, and that is really good. So the undead companions are 
obviously undead. <laughs> and they, um, they have some of the qualities of other undead, but not others. They are immune to death effects, poison effects, and disease effects. However, they are not destroyed at zero hit points, and that's an important balance uh, decision made by the designers, um, which I agree with. So instead of becoming destroyed, they get the dying condition, and you get to heal them as you uh, would with living creatures. It's just that there's you have to use different methods <laughs> to heal them, such as the stitch flesh feet or negative energy or something else. Now, these are uh, all tagged uncommon, and the book argues that they're generally available only to those with the undead master archetype or those who have an intrinsic connection to the realm of the dead. Also, uh, this could be a way a table can solve having a um, devoted animal companion die uh, to have them come back as an undead one. And this is where I again question the creature creation rituals chart because raising a uh, Creating an undead creature of level 14 costs 13,500 gold, but raising a dead creature that is level 14 costs only 2,800 gold. And so, I don't know, it seems like it's much cheaper to make, give them their life back. Undead companions also tend to have lower ability scores than living ones. And the book argues it's to counter the immunities that they have. So this is worth noting. They also, some of them are mindless, which I'll mention when I go through them. That means that they uh, are, can only be trained in athletics and acrobatics skills, and they cannot take specializations that advance their intelligence score. Lastly, they have dark vision, with one exception, which I'll say. So the first one is the ghost. The uh, ghost is uh, has what's called anchored incorporeality, which uh, is uh, lets them uh, obviously go through solid things. However, they must always have line of effect to their anchor, which is some secret object that you have on in your possession, and so they can't actually pass through a wall uh, that you are that you are uh, on one side of. And also, they do not benefit from resistance to all damage that other incorporeal creatures do. However, they cannot be grappled, tripped, or shoved by corporeal creatures, and nor can the ghost do that to corporeal creatures. Basically, strength-based skill checks. So that's anchored incorporeality. So back to the ghost, it has a fly speed, and it has a support benefit that it can frighten enemies, and if you give it uh, the advancement feats, it can eventually get the ability to do a telekinetic assault, animating objects in the area to attack and attack enemies. Next is the skeletal mount, which must be a large creature. It has the mount trait, and it also has a very fast speed. It um, amused me that it, that it can be collapsed, gathered into piles of bone, and packed away for storage. I assume that's because you can have more than one companion. Uh, and then um, it uh, is mindless. Its support benefit is that when you're riding it, you can enter battle, and if you move a certain amount of distance and hit something, you can frighten the target. Um, with advancement feats, it can gallop and move much faster in combat. The Skeletal Servant is a humanoid skeleton that has decent fighting ability, and it's a medium creature. It is mindless, and its support benefit is basically when you strike something that it's next to, it can make that target flat-footed until the end of your next turn. So it's a great way to set up further attacks by you or by your allies. And advancement feats give it, uh, let it throw its skull and bite an enemy and try to frighten uh, uh, creatures immediately in the area. Next is the vampiric animal, which has the rare tag. Uh, it is a wolf, weasel, fox, or other predator with fangs, and this can deal, as its support benefit, deal persistent bleed damage to an enemy. It has enhanced scent up to 30 feet, so it can detect creatures within 30 feet, and Advancement feats let it uh, 
if the creature is already getting persistent bleed damage, it lets it feast on the blood and give itself temporary hit points with a strike. Last is the zombie, which is mindless, and its support benefit is to, um, it does extra damage to creatures within 10 feet of it use it because of its rotting aura when you strike creatures and do damage to creatures in that aura. And advancement feats give it the ability to, when it's grappling a creature, to do a jaws attack to do more damage. So next we go on to undead specific familiars. Familiars in Pathfinder 2e are um, pretty much a blank slate normally, and you get to assign, you get to mix and match different master and familiar abilities via your familiar while you do more daily preparations. But specific fam familiars were introduced in the advanced player's guide. And if you have enough abilities to assign in the morning, you get to qual and you qualify for a specific familiar, you can get a specific familiar. This adds to the list and it adds the crawling hand, which requires three abilities. It has a manual dexterity. It can deliver spells and um, take out things out of your pack for you. This just seems like a lot of fun. And it has the ability called Lend a Hand to automatically succeed at giving aid to a creature. So this is one exception to the reactions. Uh, minions cannot have reactions rule um, to uh, an ally's check of your choice. Gives that um, rare circumstance bonus of plus, in this case, plus one. Um, Old friend is the next one, and so if you have a cherished pet that uh, dies, this is another way they can stay in, the, in your campaign. The old friend has anchored incorporeality. It is it can fly, and once per hour it can cast the invisibility spell on itself. And uh, next, and that requires four familiar abilities. The polong requires eight, so that's going to be hard to achieve for many characters. Uh, witches have the easiest access to this. So this is the spirit that lives in the, the bottle of the blood of a murdered person that I described in a previous video that you feed with your finger um, from Malay mythology. It's really cool. And its main ability is to try to possess a creature that it is adjacent to you, a corporeal creature. Oh, it has anchored in corporeality. It can fly. And it also has spell casting. You can cast a minor spell in your repertoire as well. The Polong can possess a creature that's corporeal and it's next to, and it uses your spell DC. And uh, if the target fails, it, it controls it for a minute. And if it critically fails for 24 hours. Now this does not say it's limited in how often it can use it. And in fact, it can do it every round. Um, this seems a bit powerful to me, and I wonder if there's missing language here uh, that limits how often it can be used. Okay, next is the Talking Head, and this is clearly a um, inspired by Mort, the talking skull in the classic computer role-playing game Planescape Torment, uh, and it is uh, a disembodied, reanimated head uh, that tends to be mouthy, opinionated, or downright obnoxious. And it um, its special ability is to not take damage when you kick it. <laughs> and I um, does not have much practical use, but it's very funny. So um, we have another rule I'm criticizing, which is says specifically that undead familiars, uh, when reduced to zero hit points, are destroyed. Um, okay, for living familiars, the rules say that does not include spell out that familiars uh, gain the dying condition instead of simply die when reduced to zero hit points. However, the book does say significant creatures at the GM's discretion can be kept alive and therefore have the dying condition. And so I, I suspect most GMs do that. However, it specifically says undead familiars are destroyed and getting replacing your familiar is one week of downtime. So I we just saw that the designers made an exception for undead companions, and I don't see why they didn't extend the same uh, treatment uh, to familiars. So I think that that's another decision I question and would like to be convinced is right. 
I had thoughts on the Eidolon as well, but forgot to record it. The Summoner class gets to have an Undead Eidolon, and the Undead Eidolon has similar ability scores as Living Eidolons, but they do not get the immunity that Undead Companions get to certain effects. Instead, they get a plus two Circumstance bonus, which is very good. And they get that bonus against death effects, disease, and poison effects, and non-damaging effects that target only undead. And additionally, they are also much better at ending persistent bleed damage on themselves. At level 1, they get these bonuses. And at level 7, they additionally get the ability to drain life, to spend two actions to attempt a strike against an enemy, and do additional negative damage and possibly drain it, and give you the summoner temporary hit points. At 17th level, unlike with other summoners that get knocked down to zero hit points who have to spend three actions to manifest their Eidolon again, once per day, this summoner uh, on their next turn gets to immediately uh, regain hit points and manifest their Eidolon as a free action, which, remember, lets the Eidolon do one more action immediately, and then the summoner gets their full turn. Although the artwork implies that it's incorporeal, there is nothing in the text saying that it is. So that's it. Uh, I obviously love Pathfinder 2nd Edition. It's the game I focus my channel on so far. Uh, but, um, and I agree with its decisions to balance the game in order to uh, prevent there being an illusion of choice uh, where certain options are just plain better than others. And it opens up the field uh, of options. You don't need to worry what race or ancestry you have. You, know, uh, you don't, you're not limited to a race that gives you a dexterity bonus because you want to have a dexterity class, for example. Having balance opens up lots of choices. And in the spirit of that, they've also reined in uh, the power of things that have historically been powerful. And necromancy has historically created a, a hard to manage situation in past editions for DMs, but I would say that they were a little overzealous uh, with some of the choices here, and um, I am just pointing out certain areas where I think they went too far, and I'm going to consider, you know, being less strict about them. I don't have any specific proposals, and I'm going to put this out there so that the greater community, the hive mind, the collective of thoughts um, can come up with the best solution for our game. So that's it. Uh, if you liked this, uh, like and also subscribe to my channel. Uh, I have one more video that will focus on being an undead character. And also join the Discord community. Uh, we have pickup games for Pathfinder 2e. And also please support my Patreon. I don't get much doing from YouTube revenue and the Patreon is the primary source. So if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you next time.